How has COVID changed the political landscape in South Africa and in the rest of Africa? We speak to Professor Stig Jensen of the Center of African Studies at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much. What trends have emerged uh, during COVID? I think there have been a very, very clear trend in Africa during COVID that we see more authoritarian regimes. Uh, and But of course, there's a few exceptions. Uh, but in generally, we can see that people in Africa are more unhappy with their governments uh, during the time of COVID, but also afterwards. Were there any positive developments during COVID? I think there was three very clear positive developments when we talk about sort of regime shift in, in, in Africa. And they are the Seychelles, Malawi and uh, Zambia. I think in all three cases, we, we, we saw, and they were different, but we really saw that uh, a change of government and also an acceptance of the losers to sort of say, okay, we lost the election, uh, we are going on here. And that, that I think, seen from a demographic, uh, democratic development perspective as extremely positive. If we say certain governments have become more authoritarian, are resistance-based governments in Africa beginning to face increasing challenges? I, I think, yes. Uh, and we see it in many places that these... Uh, movements that have that have sort of had the control the transition from being sort of resistant movement to take over government we, we have seen them in many places that they have lost out or they have to transform and, and i think one of the reasons why they have lost out uh, is because there's also a tendency of these movements to be a very sort of exclusive in their way they only use their own people so you know, insider outsider perspective, and I think also one of the really challenges within this approach is also the generation shifts. You know, and the third element is you might be good as somebody fighting somebody in the in the bush, but you might not be good when you're sitting in offices and are are sort of leading a country. So I think these elements are all important to take into consideration. Have you seen that happening in South Africa, that difficulty uh, in transition from liberation movement to government? I think I see that in South Africa, I see it in Namibia, I see it in Mozambique, and I see it very clearly in Zimbabwe, definitely. And what are the consequences, the most serious consequences of that happening? I think the most serious consequences is bad governance and apathy among a large proportion, a growing pr proportion of people in the countries. What security risks result from that? I think there are many security risks, and I think in in, um, in Zimbabwe we have seen it very clearly, uh, those things here, uh, because you what you often also do is you use your security sector against the people, and, and in particular, the military, where usually in the security sector, you have this idea that the police should actually, uh, they should do the work internally. The military should work with your sort of external problems. What we have seen very clearly in, in Zimbabwe is actually that you also use the military against your own problem, uh, your own people. And that creates a lot of problems in, in relation to being seen as a government for you. What about uh, unrest and uh, radicalization? Uh, are those consequences of... too of, of the crisis in governance? Definitely. Uh, and, and I think these things about radicalization, we also see that very clearly in, in South Africa, uh, economic freedom fighters. That's a very good example of that you could sort of say split out groups from ANC that start a new party that is much more radical and in that way also attract people. Uh, because ANC haven't provided on a number of the crucial things that it should have been provided. And that opened up for uh, radical people to work together, 
they could work together in, a, in an alternative political party, but they could also work together in doing activities that are negative for the society in general. So do you see more radical forces stepping into the breach uh, when there is a crisis of governance? I see that, and I see not only radicalization, but I also think that's another issue that is really important, polarization. And I think one of the really big problems for for ANC, Sano PF, and Swapo is that they're not very good at negotiating with these other people. They try again to exclude them and try to fight them. And that is sort of poison for a society and societal aspects where you can actually keep the society together. Then you will have the society being much more fragmented and people from these other groups more, much more difficult to get a dialogue with. So if the ANC does not manage to negotiate its way um, through the next elections into a coalition government, how do you foresee its future? as a resistance-based government? I, I think it's it's clearly that ANC would have to negotiate uh, with the other political parties. Uh, and they also, maybe there, they could also get some inspiration from, from, other, from other places. For example, we have seen it uh, several times and in Kenyan context where, where we have seen some kind of coalitions going on. And I think that's something that, that, uh, that you're also looking into. And there, I also think it would be very important for ANC as a movement to try to talk, get in dialogue with these things. Because I think for South Africa, as for most other countries, uh, almost all countries in the world, we, we are facing so many crises here. So therefore, it's very important that we talk with each other and we make agreements together. I think there's much spe- speculation as to who will uh, form a coalition with who. Uh, if the ANC does not get an outright majority in next year's watershed elections, mm. so um, there's the DA on the one side, there's the economic freedom fighters. How do you see it going? First of all, I think the result play a very important role here because you know the muscles you have. You know, the voter power is actually important here. So, so I think that DA probably are in, in the strongest position because I think they will probably get a lot of votes. And also, I think DA have also had a, a lot of experience from sort of leading, um, you know, local governments in, in many places. Uh, and, and therefore, I think uh, it could be attractive for ANC to work together with them. Uh, and also, in particular, if if South Africa would like to pursue uh, the same economic development that you have done uh, since the uh, establishment of the Rainbow Nation, if they should move towards working together with the economic freedom fighters, then it will also mean that they have to change their whole, whole economic model. Uh, and there, I think, one of the difficulties for ANC and also, I think for many South Africans, is that they have seen the implications in Zimbabwe with these fast track land reforms and these other things, and how the economy have collapsed there. So I think working together with economic freedom fighters, uh, taking a, a, a new route uh, economically, is, is is something that that many people are are afraid of. What do you make of South Africa's stance? It's publicly stated neutral stance on the war between Russia and the Ukraine. I think it's really interesting what South, South Africa is doing there together with with a number of other African countries because I think what South Africa is doing now is actually what the UN should do. And the, the situation we have in, in in the world is that that we, we simply need uh, people, organization who can actually bridge uh these uh, these countries or these conflicts, and in this country conflict between Russia and Ukraine, there's nobody who tried to make that dialogue. And there, I think South Africa and the African leaders have really found a very important way where we sort of say we need to solve this crisis with dialogue. And, and you know that uh, that is actually also where I think in many ways 
South Africa and Africa can promote themselves because I think this war in Ukraine and Russia, this is a war where, you know, it's very difficult to see progress. So at one stage, they simply need to talk with each other. And there, I think the first move by Cyril Ramaphosa and these other African leaders is actually some, something that other leaders around the world would start listening to. And that could also pave the way also for a, a new way of negotiating in the world, giving Africa a more central role. For example, it could be in the Security Council in the UN, rethinking that thing. So I think this move is very smart, but also in accordance to what Africa have done many times. You saw it also during what we usually call the Arab Spring with the civil war in in Libya, where we also saw a delegation from African Union trying to uh, to have a, a dialogue between Gaddafi and, and, and some of these resistant movements there as the only one Africans actually try to have peaceful negotiations. So I think it gave you as a country and a continent a completely new rule that I'm really looking forward to see that is flourish. What about the treaty relationship between the G7 uh, and BRICS? Mm. I think that, that's that's a tricky one, but the, I think these things here is, is also interesting because I think South Africa is doing something really smart with trying to 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 play a role within BRICS and being very proud of being in the BRICS, but also at the same time trying to have good relations with the West. And we have also seen in with the recent meeting by Mark Rutte and the Danish Prime Minister, uh, Mette Frederiksen, to South Africa, we can see how South Africa is really good at trying to, you know, working with the different partners here and not trying to have a new Cold War situation. Uh, so I think, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa on foreign policy, he is doing really, really well in playing this this very, very difficult game between, you know, East and West. Are you seeing a return to Cold War dynamics on the continent? A tug of war between the West uh, and countries I, I like think, Russia and China for no, I, the spoils of the continent? I actually see uh, some tendency of a Cold War, but I think more I see the multipolar sort of uh, world playing out in Africa. Because I think what we we in in the West are overlooking is that all these other actors, because we're usually talking about China and Russia, and then we also say that they're also aligned, which they're not. Uh, and, and, but we completely overlook, for example, the Gulf countries that are very active and number of other India that is active. In the, so there's a lot of other actors in the continent. And I think the war in Sudan is a very good example where you see all these different groups are, are playing into the conflict that often is just portrayed of sort of two military people who are fighting each other. But behind that, there's a lot of other actors. Well, tell us more about that. What strategies are being used by these different actors? I think it's, it varies a lot. But I think, I think one, is, one thing that is really interesting here is that in many ways... The West see China as the sort of the main enemy, but in many ways, I think that China and the West have very much in common when we talk about Africa, because both the West and China actually want stability. They they want possibilities for trade and things like that. Where, for example, I see Russia as somebody, unlike during uh, during the uh, the time of independence and things like that, where they were where they were supporting grassroots organization, socialism was florist and everything was sort of, everybody sort of linked up with Russia because there was something different than the West. Now Russia is linking up with the regimes that are, are sort of often, you know, very repressive regimes like the Central African Republic, but they also support uh, people who try to undermine you know, regimes around the world. So so they actually like destabilization. What you can also say with, for example, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, they are in 
big time in the Sahel region, uh, the Horn of Africa. What they are very focused on is, of course, the faith-based aspects. Also there, some of these faith-based organizations mm -hmm. is also, in some ways, when we talk about nation-state, they are also destabilizing things. Also, especially the UAE, they're also very much into natural resources and things like that. So I think we should see these things as instead of some of these actors that are playing into these things. I think India is doing a completely different strategy with working through the African Union, thinking more about sort of exchanging things, talking much more about South-South cooperation, have been very sort of uh, clear on all these things in relation to COVID vaccines and things like that, selling them to the uh, to African countries and things like that. You you see countries with very different strategies. Turkey be very, very active also in infrastructure projects. There's a lot of actors there. And this is just actors from outside Africa. Then, of course, you have also actors within the continent that play into uh, um, to things and also play into conflicts. Well, all, our, all eyes will be on South Africa next year with our watershed national elections. How do you think that is going to play out for us? I think it's difficult to say, but I, what, what I hope is that it will be peaceful. That's my first. And I also hope that there will be a lot of people who participate. Uh, I still think, for, for my perspective, the born free generation, I really hope they will sign up for the election. But I think uh, they, a, a large proportion of them will not vote. And I think that's a problem for a democracy. If, if a large proportion of people are not voting, and in particular the young people, because the young people is the future. So, uh, so I think that's 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 my concern. That's that's in relation to the whole election thing. And of course, ANC will be challenged big time, uh, and it will be really really interesting to see the results, and also to see if the young uh, the people actually uh, register. Who will they actually vote for? Because this is not a homogeneous group. It's very important to sort of say they will vote uh, for for different political parties. And in that context, it will, of course, be interesting to see a, a, how popular the economic freedom fighters will be. Uh, and that's their more sort of radical rhetoric uh, and how that will link up to or how it will affect also the ANC. If many of those unregistered young people, the millions, did register, to vote, uh, how do you think that that could affect the outcome of the election for the ANC? I'm not sure. I, I think it's it's. I think it's really really difficult to say. But I would expect that it will help. You know, the economic freedom fighters more than the other political parties. And I'm sure that it will be really really difficult for ANC to get a large chunk of, of these people because they are simply tired of these old people that link up to yesterday's agenda and not coming up with anything positive, seeing them more like the problem than the solution. And that is ANC's biggest problem at the moment, I think, in relation to, to the younger generation. You, you mean the ANC that was the solution as a liberation movement has now become part of the problem as a government? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I, first of all, I think we, we should be aware of uh, Nelson Mandela is sort of still sort of a, a sort of a hero all over the world, and this transition that you had in South Africa is sort of uh, is something that that everybody sort of see as a as a as a model to to follow. Uh, but I think again, coming from being sort of an, a, a movement going into to government, that's a very very difficult thing and also it was a very difficult and still is a very difficult situation in South Africa with so many poor and marginalized people making life better for them is extremely difficult uh, for for a government and the um, ANC have not been successful uh, in that and that is not just me who's saying that's a majority of people who don't see that they've been successful and in particular with young people they are impatient they want somebody who is doing the things right. And then, of course, for young generation, things like nepotism and corruption, that's simply unacceptable. It might be something that people have sort of patron-client relation, might have been something like a culture we have, we have seen in the past, but for many people in the young generation, no way. 
Thank you, Professor. That was Professor Stig Jensen of the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, speaking to us about political trends in South Africa and the rest of the African continent. Thank you, Professor.